morning. Um, today we'll be discussing some case studies in data reuse, focusing on the data publishing service Open Context. We hope this will have some broader implications for the rest of the discipline. In 2017, the economists declared that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. The idea that data can be a powerful crystal ball derives from lots of investments in the commercial sector, in governments, and also in sciences. But when we look at archaeology and consider engagement with archaeological data repositories, the picture seems more complicated. In a series of publications and blog posts, Jeremy Huggett has asked if data really is the new oil for our discipline. Ultimately, the success and sustainability of our data repositories will depend on understanding and encouraging reuse. The Open Context team began formal investigation of reuse starting in 2010 as part of the Dipper project led by Ikeo Fano at OCLC and Beth Yano at the School of Information at the University of Michigan. Dipper emphasized qualitative research methods in the comparative study of data reuse in archaeology, zoology, and the quantitative social sciences. In 2016, the NEH awarded us a grant to continue this line of investigation with the Slow Data Project, the secret life of data, and here are some collaborators, again including Fire and Yako, and also with Anne Austin and several others. Slow data also uses qualitative methods to identify ways to better align data creation practices with the needs of data users. Slow data organized a session at the 2017 Society for American Archaeology Conference, resulting in publications about data reviews for the May 2018 issue of Advances in Archaeological Practice. These papers mainly explore professional incentives, skills and training, and data quality issues that influence data research, or that influence data reuse. But today, we want to take a preliminary look at how some of the more technical issues may influence data reuse, specifically res with respect to issues of interoperability and semantic harmonization. We'll discuss some cases of data reuse with Open Context, a not-for-profit data publishing service for archaeology. Open Context archives data with the University of California, and the U.S. National Science Foundation, as well as the National Endowment for the Humanities, reference Open Context for grant data management. In publishing data, Open Context also participates in linked open data cross-referencing data curated in other systems by other expert communities. All the data published by Open Context are ava available through a variety of APIs. We'll touch on how APIs and linked data relate to, to data reuse. As we're documenting with this slow project I was mentioning, the, pro the research practices that create archaeological data make reuse a very challenging issue. Archaeological data are very complex and varied, and it's a very labor intensive, it's very labor intensive to create data. And we're describing a huge array of diverse materials in a wide range of contexts. We have different research questions and agendas, and often work with stakeholders that have different goals and perspectives, especially when you're considering the needs of indigenous peoples. And of course, many different institutions engage in archaeology and maintain their own data according to their own traditions and reporting protocols. In addition, raw data itself can be quite unappetizing. It can take effort to clean up and document a data set, and that effort is largely unrewarding. <coughs> Open Context spends lots, lots of effort cleaning and preparing data for wider consumption. It is one of the reasons why we call it data publishing. This is just a glance at our publishing workflow, where we're trying to improve and enhance consistency and add context and intelligibility. This is where linked data becomes very important. Essentially, all the data that we publish goes through a sort of standard ETL process, extract, transform, and load process, where we take data from our original spreadsheets and relational databases and migrate those data into a common central data store 
all searchable, queryable, and accessible through a common API. This table describes the variety of data sets Open Context publishes. These range from standalone projects to projects that are a result of grant data management requirements. In some cases, authors want to participate in reproducible research and use Open Context to publish data sets associated specifically with journal papers. Similarly, Open Context also publishes data to supplement monographic publications, especially site reports. Here's one example of in the Journal of Antiquity of a neuron activation data set which was published to enhance the reproducibility of the claims of the article. Now, given all this variety of publication types that we have in Open Context, can we start to see some patterns in what's actually being reused by the wider community? Now, cases of reuse can be quite hard to identify for a variety of reasons. Data repositories increasingly look to citation of data as evidence for reuse. Open Context mints DOIs, the Document Object Identifiers, for citing data publications. However, in their soon-to-be-released paper in Advances in Archaeological Practice, Marwick and Pilar Birch note how DOI citation is not a common practice. Even if more people cited DOIs, though, tracking would still have challenges. Thomas Reuters owns a commercial service for tracking DOI citations, but we just don't have the budget to subscribe, and so we can't report on such data directly. The nonprofit Data Site Projects tracks the resolution of DOIs. However, resolution that happens only when somebody looks up directly the DOI. It does not necessarily mean use. Unfortunately, Open Context also shares a DOI namespace with the larger UC Berkeley system. So it's difficult for us to use data site metrics to gauge use. However, the bigger concern here is that DOIs really only track specific kinds of reuses, specifically the citation in formal, art, um, in formal academic papers. They'll largely miss other kinds of important reuse including developments off of our API or aggregation into larger linked data projects. A paper that we co-authored cited an open context DOI for further study on energetics and labor investments in architecture. The study compares early Bronze Age monumental construction at Tel Mazan in Syria with a late Catholic fortification wall at Kenantepe. The paper and DOI citation appeared in digital art applications in archaeology and cultural heritage. This reuse centered on the examination of individual images of fortification walls, excavation contexts, and reading field notes to get estimations of brick sizes, stone sizes, and the sizes of architectural features. We referenced specific web URIs to these items of documentation. <coughs> the, the comparative paper on energetics cited an open context DOI but it also referenced web URIs for those specific images, documents, and context records. This highlights how there's more to citation than simply using DOIs, and how URIs, or web identifiers, can also play a role, specifically if you want to look at those very granular reference to specific data records. So we want now to consider how interoperability and wide linking can play a role in archaeological data reuse. As described here, interoperability is not an all or nothing issue. This diagram illustrates a sort of layer cake of different levels of interoperability, ranging from the more general to the more, to more application and domain specific. At the bottom, a formal like JSON expresses basic data structures, links trees, lists, and key value pairs. Higher up, common standards take on a more specific semantics. At the very top, may be very specific control vocabularies and ontologies for modeling and integrating data in a specific domain, such as zooarchaeology. And what we're finding is that even at a very low level of interoperability, the data can be useful. In this example, Sean Graham used our JSON APIs to be able to extract data from the Canon Tepe project to do some interesting kinds of work in textual analysis. 
In another example, Stuart Eve with his augmented reality project Artifact Kit used the Open Context JSON API to be able to pull in quantitative data about animal bone occurrences for the visualization in his augmented reality interface. Lots of research goes into the semantic harmonization. Implementations of the CDOC CRM, data integration projects with TDAR, and other pro pro programs try to harmonize the semantics of archaeological data sets. Do such projects make sense in terms of encouraging data reuse? To explore this issue, we'll take a look at two examples from Open Context, which attempt larger scale semantic harmonization, one in zooarchaeology and the other one using archaeological site data in North America. <coughs> Our first example is in zooarchaeology, involving a large-scale data sharing project, looking at the origins of farming and the spread of domestic animals from the Near East through Anatolia and into Europe. This was funded by the NEH and the Encyclopedia of Life. The data came from 34 researchers working at 15 sites. It took roughly four person years to create about 200,000 records of specimen data. <clears throat> One can also use the linked data methods to annotate the data and provide a level of semantic harmonization. Here's an example where we linked the term mandible in a data set to the Uberon ontology concept of, for this anatomical element. And the resulting publication led by Ben Arbuckle saw lots of impact in the journal Plus One it cites DOIs in the context. <clears throat> and what's interesting is the data has been subsequently reused. In 2017, Levin Adichie and colleagues published a follow-up publication using the same data set. So there's an example where the DOIs have actually been used in a citation, which is good and is noted here by Ben Marwick. This case of data reuse centered on a data aggregated from several sources and harmonized with reference to common ontologies and controlled vocabularies. At least three papers are using and citing this data, but none of, them, none of these did anything fancy with semantic technology. Open Context expresses these data in JSON-LD so they can be loaded into a graph data store. The ontologies, especially Uberon, can be used for interfacing and other sophisticated analysis. But that's not happening. Here, researchers are reusing the data via more familiar and straightforward CSV dumps. To summarize, here at the top layer of semantic harmonization, data share common attributes and vocabularies, but in terms of reuse, researchers overwhelmingly prefer a simple CSV dump. CSV can not only express the very, can only express the very simple data structures. It is adequate for some of those zooarchaeological data, especially if one uses, only uses ontologies as a common controlled vocabulary. But simple tabular structures will be too constrained for modeling other kinds of data. Let's look now at a second case study, the one of the digital index for North American archaeology. This is showing the DINA project's current coverage. The project aggregates 500,000 government records of archaeological data, of archaeological sites across several states in North America. The project is funded by the National Science Foundation and the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and is led by David Anderson and Josh Wells. This led to publication in November of 2017 that now has over 25,000 views and received a huge amount of popular press attention. The paper describes the potential <coughs> loss of tens of thousands of sites from climate change driven sea level rise. And that data set is also being reused. Catherine Cook and colleagues have a paper discussing its uses, again in CSV dumps, in teaching in the forthcoming issues of advances in archaeological practice. However, we are starting to see also API supported use. So in conclusion, with these examples, it seems that data integration really is a worthy goal for encouraging reuse. Even a little data harmonization can go a long way, as further examples, for example, DINA's reuse by Jolene Smith or the Pelagios Project shows. 
Now, the portable antiquity scheme, which has one of the highest impacts in terms of an archaeological data system actually being reused and cited in research applications, highlights this. The portable antiquity scheme is a very large database. It is also, almost more importantly, um, internally cohesive and consistent. And because of its scale, coverage, and this internal consistency, it supports a, great, a wide variety of different research programs. Unfortunately, it is very difficult for archaeology to, re, re, to replicate something like the portable archaeological antiquity scheme. We had many, many, we have many, many niche topics in archaeology, and most archaeological research programs create relatively small but very complicated data sets. So it's difficult to achieve scale, cohesion, and reference to a wider community. This scale just shows a bunch of different sorts of annotation vocabularies that we're using in open context. And these are still insufficient to provide the level of specificity needed for many research applications. So what we have is really a bootstrapping problem. And with network data, at first, it seems when you have just one data set that doesn't relate to anything else, it's like having the first telephone and having nobody to call. <clears throat> the value of this data will improve and increase, though, once there are more data sets that we can relate any given database, the database set to. And this is going to require a lot more standard development and linking. This is an important issue because in order to create enough incentive for researchers to invest in understanding and how to approach and use a data set and to understand the issues associated with the data set, that data set has to have sufficient scale and relevance. And that's what the Portable Antiquity Scheme has achieved and we hope to replicate, replicate that achievement widely across the discipline. In the end, there are many different kinds of interoperability. And some of these are going to require special skills beyond what we can see in just this, in the CSV dumps. Cultivating a broader community with more sophisticated data skills will help promote this cause. But as we move to try to encourage reuse of published and archival data, we need to carefully consider how reuse can really take on so many different forms. Not all re reuse can be easily measured by the citation of DOIs. Some valuable forms of reuse instead emphasize the use of web APIs or web URIs, especially in the case of linked data, and especially as web data skills proliferate in our community. Therefore, we also need ways to recognize, encourage, and reward those kinds of data reuse, it's even if they don't fit neatly into the current models of bibliographic citation of data. So we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the, for the Humanities for funding this research, and of course, any findings, though, do not express those necessarily to the NEH. Thank you. <laughs>